Um, but right now, the main story for the week, I mean, the Dow still pacing for about a 3% gain. Let's not forget that a lot of the optimism this week was kicked off, uh, kicked off by progress on the vaccine front, particularly uh, Moderna uh, sharing their progress. Of course, a lot of that uh, was not necessarily peer-reviewed data that we got out yet, but we are getting some of that from other labs across the globe. China making progress in Wuhan on one vaccine trial, sharing the data there, showing uh, a relative effectiveness. And then also we have the update uh, from researchers at Oxford University moving forward with their own advanced trials in partnership with drug maker AstraZeneca. Um, it's going to be tested on more than 10,000 volunteers across the UK. Uh, but of course, just one trial in a sea of many trials out there. And for more on that, we're going to be joined right now by Dr. Andrew Herr, an associate professor in the Division of Immunobiology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital within the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, as well as an advisory board member at Hoth Therapeutics, whose subsidiary is working on COVID-19 related therapies. Uh, Dr. Herr, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. I mean, when we look at this, Clearly, there's a lot of irons in the fire, um, but the timeline that we get from Dr. Fauci saying he's still optimistic that potentially we could get a vaccine as early as the end of the year. When you hear all the progress being made right now, what does the timeline look like in your mind? Well, I think that's uh, quite reasonable, Zach. Um, it will take at least that long, I would imagine. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to these sorts of processes. I mean, you have to make sure that you get it into uh, the patients and make certain that things are safe. That's the most important thing, but also, uh, you know, that the, the vaccine itself um, is effective. And a lot of times we see some early results uh, at the very um, early stages, such as the Moderna um, uh, report, but that right now is with a very small number of patients. So we have to wait and see what happens once we see it in, in the full population of the large scale uh, clinical trial. Yeah, it was tested at under 50 patients. The, the, the trial data that we're getting out of China tested on 108 healthy volunteers at three different dose strengths. Researchers there are saying that it led to an immune response um, and that more studies are needed on that vaccine. Um, but when you look at that, I mean, I guess the, the question right now is there's so many questions about antibodies and what would be the appropriate uh, immune response necessary that you might actually see in patients that get uh, exposed to coronavirus, diagnosed with COVID-19 naturally. How many unknowns are really uh, out there right now on that front and really trying to even tell if a vaccine is going to be viable or not? Well, it's complicated because even if you are generating antibodies, um, it has to be an antibody that actually targets the right spot. So the, the virus is basically covered with these spikes, and that's actually why it's called coronavirus, because the, the spike looks like a crown. And that spike actually engages with a protein on human cells called ACE2. Once it engages that, it can then basically invade the cell and turn the human cell into a, essentially a virus factory. So if you have an antibody that actually appropriately latches onto the part of the spike protein that would engage the human cell, that's gonna be neutralizing. Um, if it actually, uh, if the antibody attaches to another part of that virus uh, you know, surface, it might not actually have the same uh, effect in terms of neutralization. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. It really depends on what type of antibody as to how effective it will be in terms of neutralization of the virus. Yeah, and when we talk about uh, this problem as a whole and the way that it is now a global issue, we are seeing a lot of control in terms of U.S. case count. Um, obviously, we, we took some pretty drastic measures here. Around the globe, though, we are still seeing cases rise pretty notably uh, in Latin America as well as the Middle East. Uh, the UK instituting new quarantine rules for international travelers, saying that they're going to be required to enter quarantine for 14 days, uh, potentially penalized a thousand pounds if they break those rules. When we look at things here, though, we, we've heard a lot of talk about flu season and why that's going to be an issue here when we get to the fall and the winter. But obviously, uh, Latin America operates on a very different calendar right now. It's their cold season. So when you look at that, how worried are you about a second wave when temperatures do start to drop here in the U.S.? Well, it is a real concern. And a lot, a lot of that comes from prior experience with other viral outbreaks and pandemics. Um, I think the real hope is that as we start to open up things, we definitely want to get the economy back on track. Um, but as we start to ramp things up again, I think it's very important for people to continue to do the safety precautions, wearing a mask, staying six feet apart from people, washing your hands very, very frequently, these sorts of things. If we do that really effectively, I think we can hope that we won't have that uh, second spike. But there have been times in the past where people 
kind of jumped back into real life too quickly. They did not take these precautions. And the second round was actually worse than the first round. Um, cases like Philadelphia versus St. Louis uh, at the start of the century. So we really need to keep that in mind and, and you know, open things up, but do it carefully and gradually. You talk about that. I mean, that being the, the data point that a lot of people point to, the Spanish flu um, back then. Uh, but I mean, right now, if you're talking, it was just interesting to see the UK taking those those guidelines in quarantine since we've heard so much complaints and, and anecdotal evidence. When you look at bars reopening across the country of people packing in, not necessarily social distancing or wearing masks. So, I mean, when you've looked at those things and you put it against the data that we've seen in the past, uh, I mean, how worried does that make you when you think about what's to happen? Well, I think the, the, the real part of it that is concerning is the large percentage of people that we're seeing who have the virus but are asymptomatic. So and essentially, it works out to be that they are kind of invisible carriers and can transmit it to other people. Now, if that person who is in contact um, it does not respond strongly and else is also asymptomatic. We won't ever know. But there are some people who are at risk. And I think that's the real concern here is that people unwittingly may be spreading it to other people who then actually have a much uh, tougher time dealing with it. So, again, I think that um, I think there's a lot that can be done as far as uh, opening things up. But it's not too much to ask, I would say, to you know wear a mask in distance, um, you know, for for as long as we need to, to make sure that we're uh, in the clear. All right, there you go. The thoughts of Dr. Andrew Herr. Appreciate you taking the time to chat with us, sir. Thanks. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.